Okay, so... We're in the middle of a few chapters where God is uh, preparing Israel. They're at, the, they're at the precipice of going into the promised land. This is near the end of Moses' life because Moses is not going to go into the promised land. Moses is going to end up going home to be with the Lord. So God is preparing them. They're going to be moving on very soon into the promised land with a new leader and in a new land... There's only one way they're going to succeed in this new land, isn't it? Isn't there? Only one way. That's by doing things God's way. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you're here with us at another Monday night Bible study. Welcome, everyone who is in attendance. We also want to welcome our internet audience on BitChute, on Minds.com, on YouTube, on Facebook. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we move on to verse 1 as God continues to give instructions to Israel to prepare them. One of the wonderful things about our God is he does not leave us unprepared, does he? He gives us the preparation and the tools we need for what we're going to face in life, doesn't he? It's our choice what we do with them. We can choose to listen or we can choose to reject. But he gives us the instruction and the tools we need to succeed. So we look at verse 1. When the, Lord God, when the Lord your God brings you into this land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you, and when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them nor show mercy to them. Nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, so the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. So why is it that God dealt so harshly with all these nations? Why is it that God wanted Israel to wipe them out? Is it because, speak up nice and loud. Yes. Yes. Are these good people that are in the land? No. no. These are people who actually will take their newborn babies and go and sacrifice them to an idol on a burning statue so they can get better weather. That's the kind of people these guys are. These are not good people. These are people who murder, rape, our favorite pastimes of theirs. This is a wicked, wicked land. God is not just sending Israel in to, to uh, take the land from these kind, innocent people. It's not like that. These are very terrible people who, if Israel tries to coexist with them, guess what's going to happen? Their evil ways will rub off on Israel, won't they? The Bible says bad company corrupts what? Good behavior. You can't walk strongly with the Lord if you're surrounding yourself with evil, can you? You can't, because the evil is going to drag you down. They're not supposed to make any deals with them or show them any mercy. They're supposed to get them out of the land, because these people are going to drag them down. Furthermore, they're not supposed to intermarry with them. You know, one of the sad things that you see happen in a lot of churches is so many Christians marry people that don't know the Lord, don't believe in the Lord. That's not the way God intended, is it? No. Everywhere you see in the Bible, as a Christian, if I ever get married, I am commanded by God to marry someone who shares my faith doesn't matter whether you're reading in the Old Testament or New Testament, that is consistent. And we've seen the effects. How many churches do you know, how many times in church do you see a woman who's been coming to church for years, praying for her unbelieving husband? She married him, he didn't know the Lord, and he still doesn't know the Lord, 
all the kids they raised walked away from God because they have the choice between following the Lord, which is not means there's a lot of things you can't do, doesn't it? Or they could take the easy way that their dad introduced them to, where they can do all these sinful things. They choose to not follow the Lord. And it becomes a point of sorrow for these women later in life. And this happens to men too, but you see the churches are filled with women that have done this. It is never a good thing. Sometimes that unbelieving spouse will get saved in the marriage. That does not mean it's a good thing to go ahead and marry an unbeliever. If you, if you marry an unbeliever and they get saved, well, pray, you, you need to praise God because you hit the jackpot. You're, you're the lucky one. That does, that's not the story. And that's not the experience that most people have. Most people's experience is many, many, many years of praying for their spouse desperately to come to the Lord because their spouse wants nothing to do with God. I've seen it far too many times. As Christians, we are commanded. If you're ever going to get married, you're commanded to find someone who shares your faith. That is number one priority in a spouse. If they do not share your faith, you should not consider them as a spouse. That's not me talking, that's the Bible talking. That's what God says. You might say, well, I have these feelings. Well, our feelings do not counteract God's command, do they? Our feelings are not more important than what God says. God, God is the king. And if you have a feeling, but God says that feeling is wrong, be humble and admit that God knows better than you do. Amen? Amen. Because they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. That is what we see far too often. One of the biggest stories, one of the biggest things you see and is people start out walking with the Lord, then they become enamored with someone. I've even seen it happen to people that I've personally led to the Lord. They're walking well with the Lord. Then they become enamored with someone. And they get involved with them when they shouldn't. If, some, if you're dealing with someone... If, if you're, we have a bunch of men in here. If, if you, those of us who are unmarried, if we find a woman that we just find she's beautiful, we just enjoy being around her and she doesn't know the Lord, you need to stay away from her and pray that someone else comes along to lead her to Christ because you shouldn't try to do, do any missionary dating. You're far more likely to be led into sin by that young lady. You know, if... Uh, Let's say uh, I were standing on this table and Brother Jim were trying to pull me off the table and I was trying to pull him up onto the table. Even though Jim, he's a lot smaller than me, he'd have an easier time pulling me off the table, wouldn't he? It's a lot easier to pull someone down than it is to pull him up. It's very hard to pull someone up. Very easy to pull someone down. That same thing works in spiritual matters as well. It's a lot easier to drag someone down than it is to pull, pull them up. If you're considering getting involved, dating someone, and you find they don't know Jesus, that doesn't mean that God can't save them, but you shouldn't date them. Pray for them, but don't date them. Don't get involved with them. The Bible says we are not to be unequally yoked. And that was not a new principle in the New Testament. It was from the very beginning of the scriptures that was a command. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars and cut their wooden images and burn their carved images with fire. Are we supposed to respect other religions? No, because what, what are other religions? An attempt to lead... Yes, other religions are ultimately an attempt to lead people to hell. Now, do we hate these people? No. We're supposed to show the love of Christ, aren't we? We're supposed to pray for them. Yeah. We're supposed to show an example of Christ-like conduct. We're supposed to be ready to share a defense of the faith. But don't get up, caught up in thinking, well, there's no harm in going with my friend to his, uh, his Buddhist uh, temple. 
There's a lot of harm, isn't there? There's a lot of harm in, in uh, going and deciding to, to visit the mosque down the street because your buddy invited you. There's a lot of harm in that. Be careful. You can be led astray very easily. I know some very, very intelligent people who once walked with the Lord who are now in false religions because it, they didn't think it would hurt for them to... Uh, Check it out. They let their guard down. And they paid a price for that. You know, we have to understand, who is the offer of false religion? I think that's the devil. Yeah, the devil. So when you're dealing with false religion, you're not dealing with the ramblings of some madman. You're dealing with the devil himself. Don't go into business with evil. Stay away. <coughs> Satan is real, and he is out there. Don't let your guard down. I know far too many Christians, some with very high IQs, very smart people, who have been so totally confused by Satan. Don't fall for the trap. Be wise. Understand that as human beings, we are weak, and we can be fooled, can't we? Yeah. So we stay on guard all the time. That's what we need to do. Yeah. Always be on guard. Have your shield ready. The Bible doesn't say you're supposed to, to have your uh, armor of God sitting in your bedroom and only pull it out on Sundays, does it? We're supposed to have it every day, right? Amen. Always on, because... The devil doesn't wait until a convenient time to attack you. He doesn't say, Ernie, you're going to work today, so I'm going to lay off you today. I'm not going to give you any trouble today because I know work can be hard on you. No, he's going to try to hit you wherever he can. If you're having a bad day at work, he's going to try to make it worse, won't he? Because that's the way the devil operates, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. He doesn't fight fair. So we need to always have our shield ready. Don't put yourself in vulnerable positions because we have enough trouble as it is. Don't go, go dabbling in the occult. Don't go dabbling in false religions. It's not harmless. It is very harmful. Verse 6, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. When the Lord chooses someone to be a part of his family, it's not about us being great and mighty, is it? But the Lord welcomed you into his family because he loves you. Amen. And we have a God who keeps his promises, doesn't he? Amen. Yeah. Even when we don't measure up, how many times did Israel fail to follow God's promises, fail to follow God's commands? I mean, how many times did they threaten to kill Moses when all he's doing is trying to lead them up out of the promised land? He's just trying to help them, and they're always threatening to kill him, aren't they? And yet God is still following through on his promises, isn't he? Yeah, amen. How many times, we're all on, if, if we're all honest, how many times do we fall short of the mark and God still loves us? Oh. Oh. If, if, we wanted to, if we wanted to make a list of all the times we fell short, we'd run out of paper, wouldn't we? Oh, yeah. And yet God still loves us. Amen. Remember the love that God has for you. That's, that's power, that love that he has for you. Don't forget it. Don't, don't take it for granted. Remember who redeemed you. We weren't redeemed from the house of, from the hand of Pharaoh, but we were redeemed from the hand of sin, weren't we? Amen. Remember who has redeemed you. Remember who has pulled you 
out of bondage. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is faithful. He is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. If you choose to love God and keep his commandments, he's always faithful. He will always be by our side. And he repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. He is also a just God, isn't he? If I choose to go out and fight against God and I choose to be a miserable thief and murderer and liar, is God going to let me get away with that? No. Everyone is going to have a... Uh, Everyone is going to have a relationship of sorts with God. Is it, a, is it a relationship of loving relationship with God where he's on your side and he's got your back? Or, it is a, or is it the kind of relationship where you're enemies of God and he's going to win because there's no way you're beating God? I choose to be on his side, amen? amen? We all have to make that choice. Are you on God's side or are you against him? He is the winner. <laughs> There's only one logical choice. There's only one rational choice. Doing things his way. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which I command you today to observe them. God does expect us to follow his word, doesn't he? Amen. The Bible is not God's book of suggestions, is it? I don't get to wake up in the morning and think, do I feel like being honest? I mean, it, did, did the, does the Bible say, say you really shouldn't lie, but it's okay if you do? No. No, it says thou shalt not lie. Amen. These are not suggestions. These are not, uh, it might be a good idea if you do this. No, these are commandments and statutes that are there, and it's important. Because how many friends will I have if I am a notorious liar who no one trusts? How many friends will I have? I, I'll give you a hint. It's a nice round number. Yes, Mr. Urbanzik back there. It's a nice round number, zero. I won't have any friends if I'm a notorious liar, will I? No. How many people will want to be around you if you just think anytime you feel like it, you just start punching people? Are you going to have a lot of friends? No. No. Is your life going to go well? You're going to spend your life in jail, aren't you? Oh, yeah. The things that the Lord tells us to do and to not to do are for our betterment. Amen. He does not, his law is not made to make our life miserable. Everything he condemns is for a reason. Because the things that he condemns are ultimately to our detriment. If I decide, I know the Bible says that I should uh, that I should stay celibate until I get married, and uh, if and if I do get married, I should just just be with my wife and no one else. But you know what? Forget about that. I'm gonna go and uh, fool around with every girl I meet. I'm gonna get diseases, aren't I? I'm going to find that my pocketbook is very strained with all the children I'm gonna father. My life's gonna suddenly get very bad, won't it? Because God is telling me this not to ruin my fun, but to stop me from screwing up, isn't he? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. If uh, we've got a few of us in here that have jobs, if me or Matt or Ernie decide to uh, steal from our employer at every opportunity, how long will we have a job? Not very long, will we? Thou shalt not steal is better th is not just a suggestion. It's a, it's a commandment for a reason. If you go around stealing all the time, you will get caught eventually, won't you? I mean, we have some really interesting... We know a lot of people have gotten fired from our, my old job and your current job for stealing, don't we? You always get caught in the end, don't you? God's law is not there to ruin your fun. It is there to save you from yourself. Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep with you 
the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you, and he will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain and your new wine and your oil, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock and the land of which he swore to your fathers to give you. You know, the wonderful thing about God, he gives us laws that are for our betterment. Our life will be better if we follow his laws. And then he blesses us because we do the things that are already to our betterment. God goes out of his way to be good to us. Remember that. And I'm not here to say that you're going to be wealthy if you follow God's law. The Bible never promises that. The Bible never promises that everything's going to be perfect if you follow his law. But he will bless you. He will take care of you. Amen. He will bless you for doing the things that are already for your betterment anyway. God's law is for our betterment, and he'll bless you when you follow his law. I would much rather be on God's side, wouldn't you? Amen. I'd much rather have him watching my back. Yeah, I'd much rather let him be the captain of my ship, because he knows which way to go, doesn't he? I don't know which way to go, but he does. You know, the smartest person in this room is clueless if they're the captain of their own ship. Only God knows the right direction. Let him be the captain of your ship. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There shall not be a male or female barren among you or among your livestock. And the Lord will take away from you all sickness and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt which you have known, but will lay them on all those who hate you. God is going to protect Israel if they follow him. He's promising he will not plague them. I'd much rather have the protection of God. There's enough trouble in this world as is. I don't need to make matters worse for myself, do I? And, you, and also you shall destroy all the peoples whom the Lord your God delivers over to you. Your eye shall have no pity on them, nor shall you serve their gods, for that will be a snare to you. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. You know, some of these nations that God is, that are in the land, which they're going to be going to war with, are mightier than them, aren't they? Some of the things that God wants us to do seem impossible, don't they? Sometimes he calls us to do something and we say, how in the world am I going to do that? I don't have the ability to do this. It's not about our ability, is it? It's about God's ability. All we're required to do is be faithful to the task at hand and let God handle the results. Amen? Amen. We might never even know the results of what we do, but if we do what God wants us to do, he will take care of it. Amen. I, I, I've told this story before, but I just remember witnessing when I was supposed to be paying attention in my economics class. I was witnessing to a guy. I don't know if the guy that I was witnessing ever came to know the Lord, but a couple years later I found out that the guy sitting behind me was listening in while I was witnessing. And when he went through a difficult time in his life, the Lord brought to his remembrance the things he overheard me saying to the guy sitting next to me. And he accepted Christ as Savior. And he found me at Purdue to let me know the story. Amen. It was several years before I knew any good came out of that. But the results are not on us. We trust God. We do what he tells us to do. And in that case, someone became saved because I was obedient. I could have said, God put a burden on my heart to witness to the individual next to me. And I could have said, well, the only chance I have to talk to him is in economics class, and I don't want to get in trouble with the teacher, so I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Had I done that, the person behind me wouldn't have heard the gospel. Do what the Lord commands you to do. Amen. You won't know, you might not, you might not know the results until you get to heaven. But God will take, will use your work for his honor and glory. Amen. 
the great trials which your eyes saw, the signs and the wonders, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out, so shall the Lord your God do to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. God is telling them that these people who seem so mighty, Israel doesn't have to be afraid of them. God is going to deal with them. We don't have to be afraid of any obstacles. Serve the Lord. Do what he tells you to do. Whatever you're afraid of, you don't need to worry about. God will take care of it. Amen. Moreover, the Lord your God will send the hornet among them until those who are left who hide themselves from you are destroyed. God will deal with them. God de will deal with the trouble. You shall not be terrified of them, for the Lord your God, the great and awesome God, is among you. As if God is for us, who do we have to fear? Who can be against us? And the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you little by little. You will be unable to destroy them at once, lest the beast of the field become too numerous for you. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you and will inflict defeat upon them until they are destroyed. And he will deliver their kings into your hand and you will destroy their name from under heaven. No one shall be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. You shall burn the carved images of their gods with fire. You shall not covet their silver or gold that is on them, nor take it for yourselves, lest you be snared by it, for it is an abomination to the Lord your God. Here's another thing. Do you know what most nations waged war for in that era? Anyone. What did most nations go to war for? Yes, they went to war so they could get so, so they could profit. During Saul's reign, the Philistines went to war against Israel. They took took out all the Israeli blacksmiths. And then they set up shops so the Israelites had to come to them for swords. Had to come to them for weapons. So they were selling their enemies weapons and they weren't letting them get the real weapons, were they? But they were the ones sharpening the Israelites' weapons while they're at war with Israel. It's, these nations went to war for money. For them it was all about the Benjamins, so to speak. They wanted money. They wanted to profit. God says to Israel, no, you are not going to war to, for monetary gain because you can get, be ensnared by that, can't you? As a Christian, are we is money supposed to be the most important thing for us? No. No. God is supposed to be the most important Amen. thing. And there's a whole lot... There's a whole lot of things that rank higher than money, don't they? Your family is more important. Other people is more important. We are not supposed to love money, are we? Yes, we need money, but we're not supposed to love it, and it's not supposed to be our priority. Israel was not supposed to go to war to accumulate wealth because they'd be ensnared by it. What happens when you make money your priority? Can you ever have enough? Think about how many people there are out there who are billionaires. They have more money than they could ever spend in 20, 30 lifetimes. And they're working 70, 80 hours a week to get more. Do they need to work another day in their life? They could just enjoy that money, couldn't they? But when your God becomes money, you'll never have enough, will you? They're wasting their time. They don't need the money. Everything they're making is just literally going on top of a pile in their bank. But they are working 70, 80 hours a week just to get more that they don't need, that they'll never be able to spend. Because money has become their God and they'll never have enough. Don't ever put money first because you'll never be satisfied. Only the Lord will satisfy you. Money will never do it. Nor shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor it, for it is, a cur it is an accursed thing. They were not supposed to bring 
What are the abominations that we've read about? We've heard about the gods, aren't we? They're not supposed to bring those gods in, are they? They're not supposed to bring the beliefs of the Canaanites into their land, are they? They're supposed to keep their focus on the living God, aren't they? Amen. Yeah. Because these other gods will become a snare. I've seen so many people. They, get, they learn a little bit about the occult and they become interested in it. And it's not going to hurt me to name your occult practice. I don't really, I'm not really doing it because I believe in it. It just looks fun. I've seen so many people fall into the occult. I've seen so many people fall into false religions because when they first looked at it, they thought it was harmless fun. It wasn't, it was, they, they, they'd tell themselves, I know it's not real. Before long, they'd be ensnared. Don't even entertain the thought because Satan is real. He is out there. And he will destroy you if you give him the chance. As we conclude chapter 7, we ultimately have to make a choice, don't we? Who are you serving today? Who do you love above all? You will only be satisfied if your love is the Lord. He is the only one that can satisfy you. Without the Lord, you won't find peace in anything. You won't find peace in your family because without the Lord, you're going to have a lot of trouble, aren't you? You won't find peace at your job without the Lord because work always has trouble. The Bible tells us if you read in the book of Genesis, there's a curse on work, isn't there? So if you're not walking with the Lord, you're going to have trouble at work, aren't you? You won't find fulfillment there. If you're not walking with the Lord, there's nothing that will bring fulfillment in life. But there's a whole lot that will destroy you, isn't there? The Lord, he is the one that can bring peace. The Lord, he is the one that can bring victory. I can't bring victory for myself, but God can. And I need to humbly choose to put him above all. Even if I don't understand what he asked me to do, I need to understand that he's greater than me. I might not understand why he has told me to do this, but... He knows more than me. I'm going to be humble and say, okay, God, you know better. I'm going to follow you. Amen. I don't need to understand it all. As long as I understand that God knows better and I'm going to follow him, that's the smartest play you can make. You don't have to be a genius to make a smart decision, do you? The smartest decision you can make today is to be humble enough to say, if God says it, I'll do it. Whether I understand it or not, that's what I'm going to do. It'll save you from a lot of heartache. It'll save you from a lot of pain. So much better to go through life with the Lord on my side than the Lord against me. Amen? Amen. Hope and pray that's a choice we'll all make. Father God, I thank you for your word. There's so much we can take for our own lives out of what you told Israel, Lord. Help us not to dabble in other gods. Help us to not worship money. Help us instead to trust you, to follow your ways. Your ways are for our, be our benefit anyway. Help us to obey you and to humbly accept that you know more than we do, Lord. The, your word says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Help us to have reverence and awe for you, Lord and to humbly accept everything you say is true and follow it so that we don't end up shooting ourselves in the foot time and time again, Lord. Thank you for giving us guidance, for giving us statutes, for giving us commands, for giving us rules to live by. Help us to cherish them and live by them, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hello, I'm Pastor Larry Evans, and you've been watching a New Life Church video. If it has been a blessing, please like, share, subscribe, and comment on it. We'd love to hear from you. Our website is www.newlifenwin.org and has our schedule as well as more information about us. God bless.